Welcome uh, to this event on AI in Whitehall. My name is Matthew Feeney. I'm the head of technology and innovation at the Center for Policy Studies. Uh, and we're here to discuss a, a topic that I think comes uh, on, on the, the tail end of uh, the topic that I think dominated much of public policy last year, namely uh, improvements in artificial intelligence. Uh, it won't be a surprise to anyone in the room in this city that uh, government is keen to seize on the opportunities uh, raised by artificial intelligence, but it of course comes with a host of risks that we want to address as well. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Oliver Dowden talking about uh, the uh, AI replacing the ministerial red box, or at least uh, in hinting in that direction. Uh, and joining me to discuss uh, this issue, we have uh, Alex Burkhardt, MP, who is the uh, Parliamentary Secretary f uh, for the Cabinet Office with a strong interest in AI and efficiency in government. Uh, and we have uh, Dr. Jonathan Bright, the Head of AI for Public Services at the Allen Turing Institute. Uh, what I want to do is to give them both uh, an opportunity to uh, make some opening remarks and then we'll have a discussion uh, and we'll finish off with a Q&A session. Uh, so to begin with, Alex, I thought I would ask you uh, what, what has the Cabinet Office been doing over the last year to think about AI in Whitehall and where do you think are the the main opportunities. Well, look, thank you very much for having me here today. And uh, look, thank you for the CPS for all the work they do on government efficiency and have done over the past 50 years. It's um, you know really, really good to have a chance to talk to you today. <clears throat> and I, I joined uh, the Cabinet Office just over a year ago in October 2022. And um, my uh, one of my constituents joked at the time that um, that it meant that I'd, I'd now become Jim Hacker from Yes Minister because uh, Hacker was, as you'll remember, the Minister for Administrative Affairs, and uh, that is obviously the Cabinet Office. And um, when um, when Oliver Dowden gave his speech in December about uh, AI and the changes we were making, he um, he, he quoted uh, quoted Yes Minister saying, you know, the "Problem is, Minister." Doing things cheaply is very expensive, and um, uh, and I uh, I remember an episode of um, uh, I, you know, preparing for today. I remember an episode from uh, the first season called Big Brother, where uh, Jim Hacker is sent out onto the TV uh, to defend the new uh, national integrated database. He says it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a computer for storing up information and saving government time uh, computers are good news and um, these are the lines that I'm uh, I'm being sent out to say today um, I am um, uh, just after I joined uh, the cabinet office uh, about a month later uh, one of the big technological shifts of my lifetime uh, emerged onto the public uh, scene and that was chat GPT and uh, as someone who um, you know whose background is in medieval history I, I was not prepared for this uh, and I, I was uh, as surprised and enthralled uh, as everybody else to spend evenings mucking around with it, uh, asking it to create new recipes, uh, beef in marmalade, excellent, um, uh, to uh, write poetry for me in Old English, really not bad, and, um, uh, and also having a long argument with it about the outcome of the Battle of Otford in 776. Uh, because uh, the outcome of the Battle of Otford, as you all know, uh, is contested. Um, uh, nobody knows who won. Uh, so I asked ChatGPT who won it, uh, and it made up an answer. And when I told it the answer was wrong, it assured me that it had gone back to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and checked uh, and gave me a different answer. Uh, and so it lied to me uh, repeatedly, uh, over and over again. I, so I swung from a position of uh, having enormous faith uh, and trust in this fantastic new technology to having no faith at all. Uh, and since that time, I have been in the process of uh, rebuilding my trust and trying to work out uh, with some of the excellent people who work in Cabinet Office uh, what we can rely on this latest generation of technology to do. And uh, I, well, one of the early acquaintances I made at Cabinet Office was with a 10DS who people in this room will probably know, um, but many people outside of it do not. Uh, the, the 10 Downing Street uh, data science team e are some of the unsung heroes of Whitehall, and uh, the, the head of 10DS, uh, Dr. Laura Gilbert, is, is here with me today. 
Uh, Laura, for those of you who don't know, has has come from um, you know academic and private sector background. She has a doctorate in uh, particle physics from Oxford and is a champion kickboxer. Uh, and um, uh, and is uh, someone who is highly adept at making things happen in government and starting from position of um, of understanding number 10's data needs and government's data needs uh, has helped take us on a journey to uh, um, understand just what the potential capability of artificial intelligence uh, might be across government departments. And having uh, spent a lot of time with Laura, we came to the conclusion that what would near what we should be developing uh, in in cabinet office and in number ten was a central repository of uh, very high end artificial intelligence uh, experience uh, and skills, which we could then use to uh, help departments solve the problems that they wanted to solve, to build the infrastructure that they needed to build, uh, and uh, in some instances to be able to build something once and use it many times. And, um, uh, and uh, fortunately for us, uh, in the latter part of last year, we got the Prime Minister's support to do this, we got the Deputy Prime Minister's support to do this, and, uh, and Oliver Dowden uh, announced that we would uh, be recruiting um, you know, 30 specialists uh, in his speech in December. Since then, we have uh, we've advertised those roles, and uh, we are putting the applicants through an extremely uh, rigorous set of assessments. And uh, for thirty roles, I think I'm writing saying we've had uh, over five hundred applicants. Uh, over three hundred of those have passed the assessments, which I'm told is unheard of. And so the enthusiasm for people to move out of the private sector, and um, you know presumably take quite a considerable pay cut, in order to work for the government on the, the next generation of, of AI work is really there. It's really tangible. And it's extraordinarily exciting for, for us. Now, what we're, um, if I'm going on too long term, you can cut me off, but um, the, um, that um, what, we're, what we're now uh, in the process of doing is uh, scoping work with a series of government departments to identify where uh, the opportunities and low-hanging fruit, and the most, perhaps most importantly to, uh, of all, the opportunities to prove to Treasury that there are cases where we can save money in the short term uh, and reinvest that money uh, in making other change take place. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I, because we're at a, a sort of an embryonic stage, I, I can't go into too many specifics. But obviously, we are looking at. Uh, where we can um, you know, rapidly improve efficiency, where we can uh, detect fraud, where we can reduce error, uh, and uh, where we can increase productivity. Uh, uh, one of the areas um, uh, where we've uh, we've had some early um, uh, success uh, is uh, in uh, the development of an AI red box for ministers. Uh, now this came out of uh, a hackathon that Evidence House ran sort of middle of last year. Uh, Evidence House, um, you know, uh, be, being uh, one of the things that 10DS runs. And um, uh, I was I was one of the judges and, uh, and a team, uh, about five people, worked uh, this idea up in the space of about three days with, uh, with almost no money at all. And what it does is it can read uh, the documents that uh, go into your red box, uh, it can summarize them, it can uh, highlight uh, a, a connections between papers, connections between previous papers, uh, and over time, as we fine-tune this model, uh, it will become, I believe, um, the institutional memory of the department again. Uh, and that uh, obviously one of the great things about cabinet offices, we have a lot of brilliant people who pass through. They don't always stay that long. Um, and, and it means that uh, things that happened three, four, five years ago, uh, those people are not around anymore. Uh, but with uh, an effective AI uh, red box, uh, that won't be a problem anymore. Um, we will be able to retain the experiences of, of previous policies, previous successes, things that weren't so successful, and um, but as well as consultations, policy tank reports, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, we will also uh, we also think that uh, before long we will be able to use it 
to summarise what colleagues are saying in the House of Commons um, and have said uh, to um, you know to help us know you know, who we require, who we we might need to persuade, and um, who are our natural allies. Um, but most importantly, well, not most importantly, as importantly, uh, it will it is in the process of helping the people who work, brilliant people who work in my private office, spend less time on admin and more time on policy work. And now, whilst that's not uh, an actual, uh, an obvious kind of uh, efficiency saving, which I can say to you know, Jeremy Hunt, you know, this is the price tag, um, it's, um, it's something that you really feel uh, very quickly in your team, uh, because they have time to do things that they previously wouldn't have had to do. So we have, um, you know, we are having those conversations right now, building these systems right now, that uh, we hope will enable us to go to uh, Treasury uh, for budget in the spring and uh, and say we are starting to prove the potential of these systems uh, in uh, in Whitehall and um, uh, help us go further. Anyway, I'm going to stop there for now and um, no, thank you. you. That's a very <coughs> very helpful background, uh, Jonathan. Uh, you have. Uh, a, a relatively new study on uh, the actual current use of generative AI. Uh, so I'm hoping that you might be able to uh, talk us through the, your research so far about what the state of play is about the use of AI or generative AI in, in the public sector um, and what that research reveals about what we should think about going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the invitation uh, to be here. It's a real pleasure to be here talking about this topic, which is really close to my heart. It's been close to my heart for the last 10 years. I've been working in government digitization for about that long. And I've always been convinced that the inner machinery of government, the bits of computer systems that help you know, our skilled public sector professionals, the doctors, the teachers, the social workers, emergency services do their job, are really critical to outcomes in public policy and also don't nearly get enough attention when we're thinking about how to improve uh, public services. So I've been doing this for a long time. I've been working on digitization for a long time. And this year, over the last year, I've just been struck by how much new optimism there is that we finally have the technological capability to really make some changes. We've been doing AI and data science in the public sector now for quite a while, you know, five or six, seven years. And probably most people in this room have seen a bunch of proof of concept projects, a nice pilot that looks flashy if you see a demo. But sometimes we feel that doesn't really cut through to major gains, to major public sector improvements. And, uh, and often I feel that you know, the public sector's kind of lagged behind the private sector in, in terms of its ability to make use of this technology. And th there's lots of reasons for that, which, are, if you like, aren't the focus of today. But suffice to say that I do think now we're faced with a technology that the public sector can really make use of to make improvements in public services. And in fact, the, the key opportunity I see is the one that was kind of just mentioned here, freeing up the time of someone, and it, it might be a policy analyst in, a, in an office, it might be a social worker, it might be a doctor, it might be a teacher, freeing up their time from bureaucratic tasks, from administrative tasks, which everyone hates, and that's one reason it's hard to get people to listen to me talk about bureaucracy, because people hate it so much. Everyone hates these tasks, and they burn people out, and they squash a lot of enthusiasm for the public sector, even though, as, as you quite rightly said, people want to work in the mm. public sector. People want to go and help people as a teacher, as a doctor, as a probation officer. Then what we see consistently, this was mentioned in the note that was circulated before, is that people often get into these professions and burn out and get overwhelmed or get frustrated by the fact that they can't really do the job that they were hoping to do. Um, and, you, you, you know, and you can find statistics about this all over the place. The one that stuck with me was in the last academic year, 10% of the UK's teachers quit the profession. It doesn't include people retiring. And, that's, you know, and as I think we all know, people who know the education profession will know uh, teachers are working 50 hours a week. They're working in the evenings. They're working on weekends, on lesson plans, on marking, <laughs> on safeguarding responsibilities, on administration. So the opportunity of these technologies to save some of that time and as you quite rightly said, whether you can translate that time directly into an efficiency saving or a financial saving is you know, perhaps an open question, but to save some of that time and to allow these people to focus on what they wanted to do, wanted to get into, to help children, uh, to help uh, prisoners reform, these kind of things, 
is the key opportunity that I see. And one of the things that we're working on most closely right now at the Turing Institutes, which I'll pause briefly to say if you haven't come across it, is a National Institute for Data Science and AI focused on applied applications of these technologies. So it's my job to help get, to help innovate in these technologies and then get those innovations directly into the public sector where they'll make the, the most difference. Uh, now, the question was, and that was a long preamble, but the question was about the, this, this research. We've just released a paper looking at uptake of generative AI in public sector, public sector work across public sector professionals. It's a baseline study. It's work that I hope to improve on a lot throughout the year, and I want to highlight straight away is that as a sort of quick snapshot type study, it's not fully representative of all the professions uh, that we're trying to cover there. This was done through a paid <coughs> survey platform. So one, one of the ways we're going to improve on this is by doing uh, profession representative surveys uh, in the medical profession as one we're doing right now, and then hopefully with teachers uh, later on in the year. But the survey was about asking people to what extent are you using AI in your day-to-day, -day, and particularly to what extent are you using generative mm -hmm. AI. And this was inspired by one of, the, one of the many critical differences of this technology to other waves of technology adoption in the public sector, be they AI or not, is that in the past, the paradigm of technology adoption is very much top-down. You commission and procure a system. You put that in the hands of people on the front lines. You might train them, and you hope it, you hope it kind of makes a difference. And what we've often seen in the public sector is that very well-intentioned technological systems can kind of get layered on top of each other. They can be difficult to maintain. They quickly turn from being called our new system to our legacy system. And this is, uh, if, if you hear legacy system, that's an insult to a system. That's not a polite thing to say about a, uh, about, about a system. They get kind of layered on top, and people in the public sector, these professionals that I've been talking about, struggle, often struggle to work with them. There's been a recent study, I'm not sure if it's in the public domain yet, but looking at um, how many clicks a social worker, a child social worker, has to do before they can get to a piece of information they want, or through all the various different systems they're trying to interact with. And it's a lot of clicks that will surprise no one in the room. So anytime you see in the news, oh, there's been these terrible cases, and there have been terrible cases, we all know that, of children being neglected, and it sort of said, but this person was on that social worker's radar. You know, bear in mind that social worker's probably only got 10 minutes a week to actually interact with that child, if that. The rest of their time is spent on, on the system. And so you've got these top-down systems, but now we have a system that's more bottom-up. Pretty much anyone in this room, if you want to use generative AI, and whether that's to, to know the, the result of the battle of a contested uh, battle or, or, or something else, can pick it up and start using it. And so what we wanted to know is how many uh, public sector professionals are picking up this technology and starting to use it in their day-to-day. -day. And the answer is quite a lot. Um, you can debate about the exact number, but we're seeing 10, 20% of people saying, yeah, I, I'm using it for something. 40, 50% of people saying, yeah, I'm aware of someone else in my profession using it for something. It's often around automating bureaucratic tasks. And th th this was th the real interest and inspiration of the study. We also asked, I won't try and go through all the results right now, we asked how much time people are spending on bureaucracy, how much time do they think that they would be spending on bureaucracy if we took advantages of uh, AI and people in the NHS saying, well, I could potentially save a day, of, day a week. You can debate about whether they know the technology well enough to really say that, but th they think the opportunity is there. And saving a day a week of people's time in the NHS, you know, it goes without saying that. That's the kind of technology that, that gets people excited and will make a huge, uh, huge difference in the way perhaps some of the previous AI uh, technologies haven't. And we also looked at things like trust, and we can come onto it later if you want. And this is perhaps, uh, you, you know, you mentioned right at the beginning on the risks end of the spectrum. People tend to trust this technology quite a lot. They're quite confident that they understand how it works although they'll often say that they don't feel that there are clear guidelines coming out of their department about how to use it, which I think is right. They think that they've kind of got a handle on it. And that part is the part that is maybe the worrying end. So one of the big focuses of work that we're doing this year, apart from this um, measurement aspect of who's using it, is to think about how can we make these systems um, accountable? How can we measure a concept like accuracy? Or just ask, how accurate is the system? That's something which, in the past, we've known how quite easily how to define that in technological terms if the system's making one decision. But if you've asked it, you know, in a red box context to summarise dozens of documents into one short paragraph, it's actually scientifically not that easy to say that's the best summary that you could have had or that's an accurate summary. So that's a real lively area of work for this year. And I think getting that part right 
will be the thing that really enables uptake uh, across the public sector. Great. Well, that was a, a good introduction. I we'll want the rest of the, the discussion to actually be a discussion. Uh, and uh, I want to start with Alex uh, and, and then Jonathan, if you could jump in. Uh, so I have a, well, the obvious first question is who won the Battle of Watford, but we can do that later. Um, uh, but the... The Mercians. The, okay. I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure a contested the topic, I'm sure. Um, I want, because we're having this discussion in the wake of a lot of news about um, technology screw up in government with, with the post office and the horizon scandal there. Uh, and I think despite a lot of the potential for artificial intelligence, there is a concern about the trust that the public will have if AI uh, overtakes or takes over a lot of the, the, the functions of Whitehall. Um, so, so two questions about um, the, the, the culture required um, in order for this to be accepted. Um, one is, uh, how how can the government reassure the public that biases seen in a lot of AI systems aren't incorporated and going to hurt people uh, down the road if they are, they are widely used? And secondly, uh, AI to be efficient requires a lot of data oftentimes. Um, what are the privacy safeguards that will um, will reassure members of the public? Um, so I want to start with Alex, but then I'll, I'll get Jonathan's input there. No, sure. And there, there's, a, um, there's a very important and fair questions. And one of uh, what you, you, you will have detected and what I've already said is um, the approach that we have chosen to take with this work is, is very much in-house. And um, you know, we have gone through uh, a period of um, where in-house has often been balanced or completely outstripped by outsourcing. And um, one of the, particularly with a nascent technology, a nascent capability, um, we very much wanted to have a team of people who really understood it or were uh, the most capable people we could find who to understand it uh, so that they would uh, first create that locus of understanding within government. But secondly, uh, help us build things that we had ownership of. Um, I don't mean just sort of uh, in, in terms of having um, proprietal ownership of it, but we, um, yeah, we, we had a team of people who uh, had been part of the journey of, of building it and, uh, and, and knowing exactly what it could do. So to a certain extent, um, you know, whilst there will always be room for improvement and there will always be room for human and computer error, um, you know, I think w uh, in this venture, at least, we are we're we're, we're sort of closer to the core of it, and um, and in terms of uh, data, obviously, I mean, da data is now everything. I mean, in the same way that in the same way that uh, wind or coal or oil powered uh, created the productivity of the machines of previous uh, generations, data is going to create the productivity of the machines of the future, and. Um, and we have, government has a lot of data, but we are also very careful about how that's shared. I mean, some people might say that we're sometimes too careful and that that, uh, that, that, uh, that care uh, yeah, prevents us or slows us down in doing uh, certain bits of work. But the, all of the laws uh, that existed around data sharing before these new technologies became emergent are still there. They still apply. And, um, you know, we... We, you know, and the public, you know, the public cares about these things, and, and, and rightly. I mean, we had a consultation on a um, you know, very important piece of work we're doing on um, a one login, which is uh, one of the initiatives that sits um, alongside gov.uk. Um, you know, one one login using the uh, Data Economy Act to allow p to uh, allow members of the public to give permission to the system to share information about them solely for the purpose of identifying who they were. So sort of single act. And we had more responses to, uh, to that consultation than any other I've ever worked on. And so yeah, the, the public had tuned in on this. And um, if, if, we, if we were to overstep the mark, they would be right on us. So we, we take it very, very seriously. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I really agree with what a lot of what was just said. I think getting government to do technology in-house is critical. It's easy to forget that government used to be a real hub of technological innovation. You know, I, I work at the Turing Institute. Turing built one of the first computers, depending on how you define it. Who did he build it for? It wasn't the private sector. Mm. We can do innovation in government. We can build amazing technology in government. And I think it's so important. And that is one of the heartening things, as I said, I've been doing this for a while. That's one of the heartening changes I've seen in the last few years. More and more 
data scientists, AI professionals emerging into government, being hired into government, just heard uh, uh, about some of them, 10DS, the Cabinet Digital and Data Office, uh, GDS, the ONS Data Science Campus, and all of the departments, lots of them have big AI functions or data science functions right now. So th that's really heartening. And I think that, of course, you know, the private sector has a big role to play in this. Of course, that goes without saying. But we don't want to get into the situation where we say, you know, th this new AI technology is great. Who, who can I procure that from? I'm just going to buy it and bring it in as a product. We're, and we're not ready to do that, and I don't think we'll get ready to do that. Um, so building stuff in-house, I think, is critically important. And uh, as you just said, government has these huge data resources. One of the many changes in the way people have been thinking over the last two years is to start to think, okay, language models, hugely important, that goes without saying. The basis of a language model is data, training data. What's going to be the real distinguishing factor between language models when the architecture of the model is well known, when uh, they're very expensive to train, but it's not a particular secret how that training takes place? Well, the key differentiator is data. So huge stores of data within government have huge amounts of potential value. And so I think there's real possibilities for government to do things there. It's also worth really highlighting the open source movement in language models. There are some big models which are procured, you know, you have to pay for them. You have to pay, perhaps not very much, but you've got to pay for them. There's others, but you can bring them onto, you know, I've got, got them installed on my laptop. You can bring them onto your computer and work with them straight away. You can fine tune them, you can retrain them to specific tasks. I think it's critical um, and, you know, w one of the things we're thinking about, of course, is how to regulate these technologies. It's critical that we pay attention to safety, but we don't end up squashing the open source movement because we can bring in a lot of that open source technology into government and use it to approve uh, what we're doing. But then the, the last thing is, <coughs> is assurance. We definitely need a framework for saying, you know, if I'm going to use this to automate a bureaucratic task, I need to know how accurate is that by some metric. A lot of those metrics, as I said previously, don't exist yet. No, and that's that. I completely agree with all of that. And you know, obviously, in um, in cabinet office, we also have CDDO you know, very heavily involved mm. in uh, trying to work out you know uh, what the frameworks of um, of generative AI <laughs> I, I ought to be. And I think yeah, the the in house outhouse um, uh, in in house outsource um, argument is um, is is very important. I'm very pleased to hear you sort of agree with what uh, what, what I was saying. And I think there, there are limits to it in the sense that I think potentially one of the big drives of productivity across Whitehall will could be something like Copilot, mm. Mm. Uh, in that uh, you know, most government departments are on Microsoft. Microsoft is going through this rapid process of, um, you know, uh, of, of improvement and uh, of uh, upgrading. And within a very short period of time, uh, AI is going to be in everyone's mm. Microsoft Office. Now, I think the challenge for for us, I say, feel it very acutely, um, is that it's um, we could get that new capability, and if we don't train anyone to use it, mm. <laughs> it will just sit there. Mm. Uh, and we know that this happens because we have seen it before. Um, if you uh, anybody who uses Excel, uh, if they're like me, um, uh, knows that you probably use about three percent of what it, uh, Excel is capable of. Mm. And um, uh, and the same thing could easily become true of of Copilot. That unless we uh, help people take the next steps and make the most of it, uh, it will it, it will sort of lie dormant. But if we manage to uh, break into that, then then the gains are enormous. I mean, mm -hmm. the you know, potential for people who have no real understanding of how to use something like Excel to effectively be able to talk to the spreadsheet mm. <laughs> and describe mm. what they're trying to do and what they want to get out of it will um, upskill huge numbers of officials. Uh, so yeah, I think um, I think we, whilst we, we very much want to build our own stuff, we also want to make sure that we're taking advantage of uh, the, um, you know, the, the new material that will, will come in uh, by default. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, there, there was one of the many interesting quotes from last year was the, the fastest growing programming language is now the English language. <laughs> because to interact with these tools, you're prompting them in English. And there's so many different ways you can ask it to perform a task. And if the longer the task is, the more variety there is in that, uh, uh, in that respect. We don't know right now. Let's say I'm, I want to use the tool to create a thousand word report. So mm -hmm. I just said we don't know how to evaluate the accuracy. We also don't know what's the best prompt that I should put in that will give me the best <coughs> possible report. Anyone who's been following the technology as well would have seen if I ask it to write some computer code, it'll write me some computer code. If I say, first of all, you are an excellent computer programmer, 
programmer, write me some computer pro computer code, the code will be better, or at least it will be better on, on some metrics. There's a whole, and what we'll, we'll see is, as it's placed in people's hands is that every, there'll be 100 people developing 100 different ways of working with it, and 100 different ways of prompting and getting the best out of it. Finding a balance, I think, between yeah, in-house innovation and procuring in, and also allowing for innovation within public sector, and also, but of course you want some degree of standardization across some degree, some types of bureaucratic processes will be one of the interesting things. Uh, that we're working on, I think. I think a, a lot of people listening to the discussion will be uh, wondering about <laughs> the, the effect of all of this technology on, on, on jobs and what, uh, what will happen to people who end up uh, potentially being replaced by this technology. Uh, I mean, one of the more in most interesting uh, parts of your, your study, Jonathan, was that uh, a, a lot of civil servants self-report uh, using this technology, but they are mostly very highly confident that their job is safe. Uh, and when you look at the, the study showing that you're potentially saving up to a day a week in work, it seems hard to square that with people being justified and feeling very safe with their job. Uh, and I wonder what, um, do you think that uh, the, the AI revolution in Whitehall will result in fewer civil servants uh, overall, or is it a, a question of um, training new civil servants to do different kinds of things? Uh, what, what does the future um, civil service workforce look like with widespread adoption of the kind of technology we're talking about? I mean, I've, I've never liked to present these technologies in terms of saving money. I think they often don't translate. It often doesn't work like that in government, unfortunately. Past, in the past technologies, for example, predictive uh, technologies of AI have discovered bits of unmet need that end up costing more money because there's people we didn't know about that needed the services that are now being onboarded on, onto the services. If you could, and you know, let's be clear, I think that's a stretch goal that will come over time. That's not something we can turn on. If you could save a day a week of everyone's time uh, in the NHS, does that translate into doing more to serving patients better? Or does it translate into you know, doing, the, doing what we're doing now on less resources? In a, in a way, that's a political decision rather than uh, something that I uh, have a strong and view uh, on. And it's a management challenge uh, as well. And I, I think they're, um, uh, we, we're, you, we're always going to have a civil service and there are always going to be people working in it. But if we, at, at the moment, we employ... Um, in, in some areas, we employ thousands of people on uh, on uh, fraud detection. Mm. We we might may not need to employ people uh, thousands of people on, uh, to do fraud protection in the future. I hope we don't. I hope that that's something that we can make infinitely easier and cheaper for the, the British public. And um, but in yeah, in terms of freeing up ta people's time, well, you know, there's always a lot of work to do. <laughs> you know, mm. There, mm. There's and that means there's more stuff that we can do faster. And um, yeah, the it, it's certainly not the case you'll have people twiddling their thumbs. Mm. But uh, I think yeah, as we master this technology you can certainly envisage a future in which you have a smaller civil service than the one you have today that is uh, better trained, uh, capable of using the new technological capability that's out there, and consequently, because you've got efficiencies, is probably better paid. So, you know, that's, uh, but that's not, that's not tomorrow. That's, um, you know, that's, that's some way off. Uh, but as I said, I, but I, I think that the point just made is, is a very good one. The, it, there are always new challenges that emerge and new things that need mm. doing, and um, uh, and um, yeah, the, the question is how you deploy the technology to do that. Yeah. I mean, you have to be able to realise the gains. When email came in, people thought, well, we're going to spend a lot less time on correspondence. I don't know if there's any on the room that spends a lot of time on email, but like you know, so you have to the, the technology can prove things, but then you have to realise the gains afterwards. Uh, I'd be interested to know what you think uh, are the the most underrated potential for, for AI. If you take a look at how the public are, are talking about AI in government or AI generally, wh where do you think people who don't think about AI in government for a living, wh where do you think people are overestimating its potential to, to, um, to improve things? But also conversely, where do you think people are underestimating uh, where this could have an effect? I mean, just briefly, I think that, that people approach this technology in two ways. Often when they're just engaging with AI, they expect it to do something amazing that they couldn't themselves do. This artificial intelligence is more intelligent than me. And that's n not at all where I think we should be focusing. I think we should be focusing on getting it to do really simple things that anyone can do, but we're just bored of doing. They take up all of our time. And I think that's, for me, the key thing that I'm often trying to transmit. Like, let's not focus on an AI system. And of, of course, you know, they're out there and that I'm not 
trying to disparage them, but let's not focus on a system in government that finds an unbelievable new pattern that we didn't know anything about that can allow us to allocate, allocate resources in this incredible new way. Y you know, theoretically, perhaps it exists, but the, the opportunity for us right now is to spend less time writing that report that you're writing, and it's four o'clock on Friday afternoon, and you just want to get it get it finished, and you know, take a, take away some of the stuff that really sucks the fun and the joy out of working in the public sector, which, uh, as I said right at the beginning, is something that lots of people want to do. So th that would be how I, I, I phrase that. Uh, I, we, we have time for, for a few more minutes of discussion before turning it over, but uh, I wanted to, to ask Alex in particular, um, what, how do you think about implementing a lot of these systems and, and liability? Uh, there's a lot of discussion about, well, in, if AI improves at, at um, an expected pace, a lot of when, when people interact with the NHS helpline or when they want to, to uh, ask a question about taxes or things like that, they'll have a, a, a bot responding to them and giving advice or setting up appointments and those sorts of things. Uh, but, but when that goes wrong, um, how do you think about where the liability should be there? Is it the, the designer of the system? Is it a, a human overseeing the system on that day? Uh, how, how do you think about that question? No, it's, look, it's, it's really important. It's something that we've been thinking about a lot recently, as you'd expect. I mean, we've, uh, one of the, um, uh, the tools that we've been, you know, uh, seeing if we could build, um, you know, it's being done uh, largely by, um, by GDS in, in, in Cabinet Office, e uh, but also with, with others uh, helping out, that uh, is, is a, an LLM for uh, the front of gov.uk, so that you can go on and uh, say, you know, Type in. I'm, I'm a small business. Uh, you know, I want to export to you know Albania. What do I have to do? Uh, and we got we got quite a long way with it. And um, uh, and it's um, uh, I it did some strange things. If you asked questions in a particular type of way at first, it responded in French, and uh, which was unexpected. Uh, uh, good French, and uh, and the information wasn't that me. It wasn't wasn't completely inaccurate, but but also not what we were quite asking for and um but we we've having pursued that as far as we could we found that we could only get accuracy at this point of about 80 percent and that wasn't good enough you know that uh that the user expects something more now you you can start to put in caveats that say well you need to go and check the original documentation but um you know uh that is there's a question to which that's actually a labor saving device at all uh, and it sows seeds of confusion and doubt, and it's um, you know, it's actually better to focus on improving your search engine so that people see the original documents and draw their own conclusions, and then it's you know it's it's with them. Ultimately, however, that is going to be a um, you know um, uh, it w when accuracy is at ninety eight percent, you know there will be a judgment call to be made about you know uh, whether whether we think that the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Uh, but that's yeah, that's all part of watching a system mature. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I agree with all of that. Um, what we can't, you know, at the moment there's a sort of reflexive, and this applies across society, not just government. Let's leave the human in the loop, and then it'll be fine. But if the human's still in the loop and still has to do all the work, then you don't save any of the time. What you need is an automation which you're automating a task where the answer. It's hard to generate, but once you see the answer, you can know it's right relatively quickly. And perhaps that's about presenting some of the supporting information that shows the answer is right. Uh, it's, but it's an uncertain science exactly how to do that. And yeah, at the moment, just offering a service and then caveating with, this might be wrong, uh, isn't going to satisfy, isn't going to satisfy anyone. Okay, I would like now to turn it over to the, the Q&A session. Um, a, a number of my colleagues have uh, microphones uh, roaming around. Um, I, I just want to, so please raise your hand uh, and uh, I'll call on you. Uh, just a reminder that uh, questions are sentences that end in question marks. Uh, please keep your um, questions questions and relatively brief. Uh, I will start with uh, this gentleman here and then move over to the other side. Hi, uh, Brian Wheeler, BBC website. Uh, there's a question for Alex, really. Um, just relating back to what you were saying uh, about uh, the budget and your hopes uh, to 
Well, I, what are your hopes? This, the, that's the question, really. What, what, what is the aim here? Is it is it to have the red box adopted by all government departments, or is that not what we're looking at? And also, I wonder if you could just paint a picture for me of how an individual minister would, would use this technology uh, in the red box. So I'm, I'm struggling to sort of, my, you know, my image of the red box dates back to the sort of idea of sitting there with a big pile of papers. I mean, how, how does it work in practice? Uh, so the, the, the red box, uh, you know, yeah, in, in not, not not that long ago, I mean, when I was first minister, all of two years ago in uh, DFE, you get a big red box and be full of papers. And the great thing about the box was that they could only put so much in it, you know, limited capacity. Whereas once you get a digital box, it's, it can take a lot more. Um, now, uh, we were particularly with attachments and so on. Now, if you get your digital box and uh, the red box can do you a summary instantaneously of uh, what the, the most urgent things are, are a precy of what the reports say, uh, and then um, you, you, uh, you, can go, you, know, you can literally glance through. Now, as a minister, you kind of get that anyway. It's just uh, up until now, you've got six people working frantically all day in order to put those things in order, uh, prioritize them, and, um, uh, and summarize them. Now those people don't have to do all of that legwork. They can spend the time, you know, uh, chasing other things around Whitehall, which actually require human interaction. Um, but we're, that's not going to be part of the budget uh, bid. You know, we've we've already got that tool. We're fine tuning it. It's um, you know, uh, I'm using it. Um, you know, cabinet, uh, the permanent secretary and uh, Alex Chisholm, Sir Alex Chisholm, is uh, is using it. I think one of my other ministerial colleagues is using it, and you know when when we're uh, when we think it's ready, we will just offer it to everybody who wants to use it. Um, the I, I don't want to go into the specifics of the budget bid because I think the Chancellor will not appreciate me conducting negotiations through the BBC website. But suffice to say, we've got another a number of Laura and her team have a number of trailblazing projects, which if we start to see them um, you know work out in the next few months, we will want to go further with that. Um, and uh, if we um, we also understand that there there's common stuff that the government that Whitehall is going to need uh, data infrastructure and so on that will make the next generation of AI possible. We will want to talk to the Treasury about that. Um, but uh, and equally, we'll want to think about how in this you know the future spending review uh, departments can um, easily uh, access funding to modernise and uh, yeah, modernise and adopt AI. But I, I'll probably have to leave leave it there before the Treasury refuses to talk to me ever again. Okay. Um, here's a question. Yes. Hi, um, uh, I have a question about data leakage. Oh, sorry, what that? Not on? Thank you. I've got a question about data leakage, and I wonder what your plans are to stop data that you're using on your new system when it's in place, stop it leaking out to other systems. And I have an example. Um, I know somebody who works at a very big tech company, uh, Meta, in fact, and they have their own internal system, but the person that I know doesn't use it. The m material that should be meta material is being used on a different system of AI in order to do the work that's needed in a timely fashion. So I'm suggesting to you guys that your data won't stay in-house. So what are you going to do? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, it's such a good question. I'm going to hand over to the person who will be able to answer it. And uh, Laura, um, uh, what... Um, you know, uh, what what steps do we already take in order to you know, prevent uh, data leakage? Thank you. I, I think what you're talking about is more of a human problem in that the availability of large language models and you know more internet resources allows people to leak um, in a way that they couldn't before. So previously, it would be perfectly possible to go onto Google and enter something into the Google search engine that was indicative of say what the government was thinking about internally, but we wouldn't necessarily want anybody collecting data on it might, might be sensitive information. When it comes to the large language models, what, of course, you can do is enter an entire government internal secret paper uh, and send it out to you know, a, a private company. And um, it's very difficult to stop people doing naughty things entirely. Um, almost impossible, but we, we work very hard on it. And some of the ways we do that are by making sure that we present internal options. So, you know, alongside the red box, we have internally hosted large language models that they sit on our servers that we directly control. We do have interfaces that we're trialling in Cabinet Office to the outside world. 
which have a security wrapper on them that will test whether or not it thinks the material is sensitive and, and come back and warn the user and say you shouldn't be sending this out. And then, of course, a lot of these companies uh, you, you can do a, a business deal with where they guarantee not to keep the data that you're entering in those systems that is private to you. Uh, and, of course, that's contractual rather than technological solution that they will promise to throw it away. But there's an all sort of, a sort of raft of people trying to solve these problems. And I, I think one of the really key things that we need to keep doing and we're taking quite seriously is if you can't give people safe but easy access to these tools, they will go and use it on their personal phones and, and they will go and do things to get around your systems. So actually the speed that we're going here to try and give people legitimate tools that keep the data safe is I think alongside the training we're giving people so they understand the <coughs> risks is I think probably our key weapon against people misusing these systems and then leaking data in an unsafe way. Um, yes, I'll take uh, the, this guy here. Uh, hi there, Matt Field from The Telegraph. Um, I just had a question about the, the gov.uk LLM that you've been working on. Is, is that sort of you sort of hinted there that it wasn't quite working as hoped. Is that still in sort of a work in progress or is it on hold? And do you have any idea like what you thought was causing those issues? Was it to do with the fact it was sort of being built with OpenAI's ChatGPT? No, I mean, it's, um, you know, it was, uh, we discovered that we were the first people uh, in the world to, uh, to be experimenting with um, uh, an LLM uh, sort of front end for, um, for, for main government websites. And I think, uh, I think Portugal had a go, uh, and it didn't work out. But you'd have to you'd have to check that. Um, we, um, uh, but I, I think what we've run up against is just uh, the limitate the current limitations of LLMs. Uh, that they, uh, you reach a point where they speak with great confidence, uh, but aren't uh, the 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 uh, what they're putting in uh, does not match the accuracy does not match the confidence, uh, and so it's. It, it, we had a very good team working on it, um, but I think we're um, we have to um, err on the side of caution as government because we don't want to be in a position of confidently telling the public things about public services that aren't true. Um, but of course, we uh, you know we continue to um, look at whether it'll become <coughs> possible and you know functional in the future. Yeah, of course, Laura. It's, um, th it's entirely true. I, th I think there's one thing to add on that, which is not that the <coughs> technology is impossible to use for this use case. <coughs> well, we have a very specific use case. We're using it quite successfully, and we've, it won't surprise anyone, we've you know, managed to build systems that will go back and check the references and present the references to you. But gov.uk, any government website, um, that stores huge amounts of information, and some of it will be old newspaper articles that are no longer relevant. Um, some of it's been contributed by people sort of casually on the site in the form of a blog. Not everything throughout the history of gov.uk has been incredibly carefully quality assured and is still up to date and necessarily accurate. And it's probably obvious to the reader when they go in and click on something five years old, uh, you know, that this minister is no longer a secretary for state, but it's not that obvious to large language model. So we're getting a lot of success with the work we've done, and this is not wasted, we've got a lot of success where you're looking at a more carefully curated data set. But as Jonathan said, often the problem is the data rather than necessarily the technology of itself. So that's that's a secondary issue. Um, so yeah, the, the gentleman in the back there, please. Hi, uh, Peter, Digital Capital. Um, you just mentioned earlier, I heard you say about the private, you know, there's so much to learn from the private sector. Just wondered what engagement you are having with DCIT, given that's where most of the private sector engage, or from a tech and AI side, where most of them engage with uh, government. How are you learning from them? If there is any cross-departmental collaboration uh, going on there, because um, obviously we see a lot of uh, great innovation happening, and just hoping if that gets over to cabinet office or not. Uh, absolutely, we um, we have a very good working relationship with DCIT. And DCIT, um, obviously, a new department. Uh, played a very important role in um, helping supporting the prime minister uh, in the run-up to the summit, and um, you know, there. But there, you know, there now whole range of things that we we need to be in uh, regular contact with them on. So, no, very um, very excited about the work we can do with DCIT. 
I actually um, will just use moderator's prerogative to ask uh, Jonathan a question that your answer prompted me to think about. Um, so w given your work at Alan Turing and looking at um, AI in the public yeah. sector, w what do you think about the relationship between the private sector and public right now? It, uh, there are some who say there it's just too many big household names who are engaging government all the time. Uh, there is potential anti-competitive um, concerns about big tech throwing its weight around. W what do you think about the private sector's role so far in... Uh, in these discussions? Yeah, I'm glad this is being recorded. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, as I said, I've been doing digital government for 10 years. There's plenty of examples of uh, not, of less than successful engagement between government and the private sector for very large IT projects and tech projects. I think we need to be really careful to make sure that doesn't happen again. It doesn't mean they've all failed by any means. I mean, uh, you know, th and there will still be a huge role for the private sector to play uh, within government. <laughs> I'm, I'm concerned that it's quite easy to sort of skip to the end of deployment because they're very e these, these technologies are much easier to deploy than they are to assure. And that's in fact a, a common theme of a, of a lot of the, the responses we've, hear, we've heard uh, so far. And you know, the private sector will have a, an imperative around, uh, around deployment. So yeah, I'm, I'm concerned, and you've already mentioned one of them uh, earlier, post office, you know, every year there's a couple, a uh, couple like this where you have a big system it seems to be working fine. It can go on looking like it's working fine for a great number of years, and then suddenly you realise there's there's a there's a problem with it, and so we definitely need to avoid that happening with this type of technology. Um, looking, yes, yeah, so the, the gentleman there. Hi, uh, Mikey Smith from the Sunday Mirror. Um, following on from that, actually, um, Alex, you'll know that as a minister it's not always apparent straight away that the advice you're being given is good advice and the information you're being given is good advice. You're saying you're tweaking and fine-tuning Redbox, but as with you know, big systems, post office, you know, other things, it may not be apparent for, for many years that you know, maybe 20% of the uh, recommendations Redbox has been given you haven't been good ones. How, 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 do, you, how do you plan to counter that? Uh, well, look, it's it's ultimately uh, minister's responsibility to you know check the working and carry the can, and um, you know, ov obviously what's what we're uh, at at the moment is that um, nothing is going unread because of red box. <laughs> uh, so you get you get your summaries and you get your long reports behind, but yeah, you know, my private office is still reading the long reports, and so am I. And then you sort of see, well, actually, is that summary giving us what we what we want? Maybe in this way, maybe not in that way, um, and really, it's um, you know, uh, sometimes it, it, uh, it will be a, a question for ministers about how they prioritise their time with the summaries they get, uh, how reliable they think those summaries are. Sometimes you, uh, you know, it hasn't happened to me because everybody who's ever worked in my private office has always been equally brilliant. But um, you know, you might sometimes have people on your team who you thought were more capable than others, and some people's work you might want to check more thoroughly than others. Uh, it's, um, you know, uh, those sorts of uh, internal checks uh, that an individual will make aren't going to change very much. So I, I think proceeding, you know, we, we proceed with caution, uh, and we we learn. As I said at the start, I you know, first started playing around with ChatGPT. I went from a position of total trust to zero trust, uh, and then have gone on a long journey to work out what are the areas in which I trust it and um, you know and that's born of experience so um, I don't um, uh, I, I think that that's uh, that's something that all ministers will always have to weigh up okay um, we have a, a question from Alex here and then I want to go to the back of the room again Alex <coughs> Uh, hello, I'm Alex from the CPS. Um, I used to work in the Department of Health in the late 2000s, and I remember everyone was very excited about NHS IT and how this was going to change the world and massively increase productivity. But productivity in the public sector has not really seemed to increase, uh, despite the huge amounts uh, of time and effort on IT. Why, and why will this time be different? Can I put a, a number on that? One of the most striking findings from your study was that uh, I mean, this is unbelievable. Uh, total public service productivity grew by an average of 0.2% per year between 1997 and 2019. So will this time be different? I mean, so yeah, and I should highlight, that's the ONS uh, productivity statistics, which were just, just released, and I think they've just started working on those, which was really fascinating to me. You're right, so it's hardly grown, 
and in many many public sectors, places like education and social work, it hasn't grown at all. Um, that's the kind of thing that you know I wish was front page news, but you, you know doesn't excite people apart from myself often. But that period, you know, 1997, I think that was going up to 2019 from memory, covers the emergence of all sorts of digital technologies, the internet, email, you know, just computerization and digitization. And the public sector hasn't been able to realize those gains. So yeah, it's 100% not straightforward that this technology will be different. I do have reasons to think that it is different in some important respects. This bottom up aspect is one of them, the fact that you can start deploying it, if we've got appropriate safeguards in place, in your own work in a way that makes sense to you, rather than it being a system that goes on top. And I think one of the big reasons that's caused the public sector not to realise a lot of productivity gains is that new systems kind of come in and get layered on top of people. And people will have one or two or three IT systems which don't talk to each other that they have to interact with and have a load of work around. around. I mean, th there are other reasons as well. You, you know. Public sector is generally a hard place to work. It's full of difficult problems. It's full of data that's not that great. It's you know, it's really challenging. Um, but I I hope this time will be different. And I think there are some reasons to think it, it will be. Uh, I want to uh, yeah. I saw the the gentleman with the the green jumper in the back had his hand raised a few times. Sorry, it would be great if you could use the mic if possible. Yeah. Jacob Anderson from Polling Consultancy, Whitestone Insights. I just had a question about the noise that Labour's made in this direction as well, and they've put a lot of hope in AI for money saving in health and in Whitehall in the next five, ten years. And I was wondering if you thought that was a little too ambitious and what kind of time scale we might be looking at before we'd notice significant cost cutting. Yeah, look, as um, I think Labour's announcements is just... Uh, it, it's it's just chat, um, uh, you know. Uh, what we're doing at the moment is we're 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 actually building things and we're actually creating systems that uh, yeah we hope uh, in time are going to realise real um, efficiencies and productivity gains. And um, uh, but it, the the opportunity you never know how quickly these things will will be able to work at scale. But we are very optimistic and uh, the potential is very clearly there. Uh, I, one of the things that makes me most hopeful, genuinely, is that lots of bright people want to come and work for us. And you know that we have not only a great sort of ambition from the Prime Minister to, to make things happen in this space, we, are, we also have the will to um, employ some of the best people to come and help us build the, the next generation of capability. And that's really exciting. OK, um, this will be the final. A uh, question. Thank you. I'm Gabor Chantosh. I work for the Royal Town Planning Institute, which is a membership organization. We have 27,000 members, and uh, we, we represent and that half of them work in the public sector as town planners. If we as a membership organization want to support our members to adopt these technologies and improve their work, which is effic efficiency gains are direly needed, uh, what sort of research should we do? Uh, where, where should we start, in your opinion? This is mainly for Jonathan, I suppose. So planning is a great example of another area where a lot of effort is wasted in the public sector by individuals and by the public sector themselves. I believe around a third of planning applications end up being rejected. Uh, I would need to check that statistic, but it's, it's certainly a significant number. And that's a huge amount of wasted time for the people who submitted them. And it's a huge amount of waste of the time for the people who've got to read those applications. And by the way, you can find that across the public sector. You know, a significant chunk of um, uh, universal credit applications end up being rejected. A significant chunk of disability uh, applications end up being rejected. They're time consuming to put together. I think one of the big opportunities in this space is technology that can help people put together a better application or help people work out more quickly if their application's not going to be successful. Often these applications are unsuccessful on kind of technical grounds. They could have, if they'd done it dif differently, it would have been would have been different. And we all know, you know, the planning system is one of the areas where it can take a while to get planning, planning permission, but it a applies to a lot of those decision-making processes I've just talked about. But the key, I mean, I'm, I've said this a few times, the key is uh, some type of assurance. How can you know that this is doing, doing it well or doing it better? How can we work out 
um, if our system is producing an excellent planning application? Uh, how can we be confident that if it does that 10,000 times, it'll produce 10,000 good ones, or maybe we at least know what percentage of bad ones it'll be, uh, it'll be producing? Great. Well, my, my thanks to, to Jonathan and uh, Alex for, for their comments. Uh, I imagine we'll have many opportunities to discuss this issue in the coming weeks, months, and, and years ahead. Uh, the recording of this will be available in the, the coming days and weeks. Uh, thank you all for, for coming, uh, and all that remains is for me to ask you to join me uh, in, in thanking Alex and Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you.